Christina Kaleka was born in 1986 to parents Maria Kaleka and Elizabeth Rutledge. The pair separated a year after Christina was born. She grew up in Cabbage Town with her mother and 15-year-old brother, Michael. Christina was described as being a very responsible young woman and was extremely close to her large Filipino family. Many described her as being selfless, always putting others before herself. Christina was an extremely hardworking and faithful young woman who worked at St. Bernadette's Daycare in Toronto. She managed to achieve an early childhood education certificate at George Brown Community College the previous year. And although the hours were long and the pay wasn't great, Christina loved her job. She was so passionate about caring for children and always put her heart and soul into her work. She would even come into work on her days off to help out where she could. Up until this point, Christina's mother, Elizabeth, had worked a number of odd jobs to make ends meet, and she ran her own financial advisor business from home. However, upon Christina getting her job at the daycare centre, Elizabeth quit her jobs to focus solely on her business, with Christina reportedly giving her mother half of every paycheck to help pay the mortgage. Christina also paid for her brother Michael's music and self-defence lessons. Christina simply adored her family and would do anything to help them out. Aside from working alongside children, Christina enjoyed playing volleyball and spent a lot of her spare time volunteering at a church group named Youth for Christ, where she was a group leader. This role meant that Christina had a lot of responsibilities, including organising events and attending conferences. By August of 2007, Christina had been working non-stop, both at work and volunteering, and following her mother's birthday in late July, which she had also organised, the 20-year-old decided that it was time for a well-earned break. On Saturday the 4th of August 2007 at around 10am, Christina Kaleka, her 20-year-old cousin Faith Castulo and two of Christina's friends from a Filipino church group, Eddie Meag, 20 and JB Reyes, 19, left their homes in Toronto to make the 14-hour drive to Rainbow Falls Provincial Park, located 7 kilometres west of Schreiber and about 120 miles away from Thunder Bay, Ontario. The park, which spans over 575 hectares of forest, is known for its many hiking trails and handful of beaches, as well as the falls themselves. The park is situated on the north shores of Lake Superior, with thousands upon thousands of tourists visiting the park every year. The four friends arrived at the park the following day on August 5th, at approximately midday. Their journey to the park was mainly uneventful, though they did run out of gas at one stage, though they quickly got going again after a driver of a passing vehicle stopped to help them on their way. Initially, the foursome had intended to travel to Montreal, as Christina had plans to attend a youth conference there, but the hotels were either too expensive or fully booked, so they decided to go camping further north instead, in a spur-of-the-moment decision. Christina didn't inform her mother or any of her family about the sudden change of plans. The four friends went on trips frequently, but had only ever ventured within an hour's distance of Toronto when going on trips together, so travelling so far north to Rainbow Falls was new territory for all of them. Upon arriving at the park, the foursome checked in to Campsite 72. However, after realising that it was near to the road, they decided to switch to a more private area of the park. 
They pitched their tent at campsite 88 of the White Sand Lake area of the park, then ate some food and relaxed. At approximately 6.30pm that night, the group decided to take a half hour nap. However, they were all so tired from their travels that they didn't set any alarms and as a result, woke up at around 10.30pm. As the night sky blanketed overhead, the foursome sat outside of their tent, talking and laughing together, whilst drinking a few beers around the bonfire. At around 3am on August 6th, Eddie decided to go for a shower at the comfort station, located nearby, as his campmates retired to bed for the night. Eddie returned to the camp at around 3.30, sitting closely to the fire to dry his hair. Christina was still awake at this time and joked with Eddie that they should go swimming. Shortly afterwards, however, the two called it a night and went to bed at around 4. At 6.30am, around two and a half hours later, Christina and Eddie awoke, their two other friends still fast asleep in their sleeping bags. Both Christina and Eddie were wide awake and full of energy, but weren't quite sure what their plans for the day were yet. Christina went to the comfort station to use the facilities, but asked Eddie to accompany her. Whilst returning to their tent, the pair decided to go for an early morning jog to let off some steam. However, the two couldn't agree on which route to take. Eddie wanted to run along Highway 17, specifically along the Transcanda section of the highway, but Christina wanted to run within the park itself. The two then decided to take their separate routes respectively, with Eddie heading towards the highway and Christina running along a trail leading towards the falls. This was the very last time that 20-year-old Christina Kaleka was seen alive. Eddie returned back to the camp after running for about an hour, but both Faith and JB were still asleep, and Christina hadn't yet returned from her run. Eddie sat in a chair by the fire and drifted off back to sleep. Faith and JB woke up at around 9.30am, however Christina still hadn't returned. The friends weren't initially concerned about Christina's whereabouts, as she often spent a lot of time off on her own. After taking a shower himself, JB checked a nearby beach for Christina, but she wasn't there either. The trio decided to eat some breakfast before going out to look for Christina at around 11am, after she still hadn't returned to camp. The friends were frantic and fearful that something had happened to her. Eddie and JB took it upon themselves to drive up the trail that Christina had gone along until they reached the Falls car park, leaving Christina's cousin Faith back at camp in case she showed up. JB and Eddie then went along two separate trails, the Lake Superior Trail and the Rainbow Falls Trail, in an effort to find their friend, but unfortunately to no avail. The trio then regrouped and all decided to drive to nearby Rossport, thinking that Christina may have made it to the end of the trail and was waiting for them there, but again, there was no sign of her. Prior to leaving their camp, the friends left a note in case Christina returned. When the trio reached the park gates to inquire about trail maps, they told the on-duty attendant that Christina had been missing for over seven hours, and the attendant voiced their own concerns. They subsequently contacted the Ontario Provincial Police for assistance. At this point, preliminary searches were made for 20-year-old Kaleka, with park personnel checking the numerous trails and beaches. The OPP emergency response team arrived shortly afterwards to conduct their own searches and to question Eddie, JB and Faith about the events leading up to Christina's disappearance. All three were interviewed numerous times by police and were reportedly cooperative with the authorities. Several other campers visiting the park were also questioned, but nobody had any information. 
Shortly afterwards, Christina's mother was informed of the situation and immediately flew out to Rainbow Falls. As you can imagine, Elizabeth was extremely distraught with the news that her daughter was missing. Family members flooded in to support her and even a priest was called in. A full-scale search was launched by the Ontario Provincial Police where they brought in search and rescue teams, canine units and various aircraft to aid in the search for Christina. Due to the amount of experience needed in conducting such a vast search of the park, Christina's family and local volunteers were forbidden from taking part in the initial search operations. They needed to be conducted professionally and executed and conducted by those who really knew what they were doing. They needed to be experienced in searching efficiently through rugged terrain. As a result, all Christina's loved ones could do was wait. Cadaver dogs, along with their handlers, scoured the area where Eddie had last seen Christina, running along the Rainbow Falls Trail, but unfortunately, this is where the trace ended. Over the following days, police and trained searchers scoured the dense brush, the many park trails, rivers and the falls themselves in the hopes that they would find something to indicate where Christina was or what had happened to her. But again, these searches yielded no significant results. It is alleged that a pair of socks were found near the bottom of the falls, but it's unknown if they belonged to Christina or somebody else. A footprint was also found, but once again, authorities couldn't link it to the missing woman. A grid search was also conducted a few days later on August 11th, and aerial teams even used the likes of infrared cameras to trace any signs of life in the early hours, but all they found were bears and moose. The police were also informed of a number of areas in the park where the number of birds, more specifically ravens and vultures, were higher at certain coordinates. This would indicate that perhaps a deceased being was present there, either animal or human. However, upon investigating each of these leads, nothing of significance was found. Over the course of the search, over 100 police officers and experienced civilians were involved. They used all of the technical tools that they could to find Christina, including GPS mapping software, the infrared cameras and even an underwater side-scanning radar. But despite pulling together all of the resources that they could and staying hopeful that the daycare worker would be found alive, Christina was never found. The search was called off after 17 days on August 23rd. Her family were understandably devastated, especially Elizabeth, her mother. Despite her pain, she thanked each and every person who helped search for her daughter. Authorities didn't find a shred of evidence within the boundaries of the park to indicate where Christina was or what had happened to her. If she was still out in the brush somewhere by the time the search ended, chances were that she would have succumbed to the elements, although there was still a small chance that she was alive somewhere. If Christina had gotten lost in dense foliage, a theory which is deemed most likely due to the fact that she had very little experience in the wilderness, police would have found evidence of some kind to indicate that she had been there, but they simply found nothing. Some speculate that it is very unlikely that Christina would have gone off the trail and gotten lost, especially after having had a similar experience just a short while prior to her disappearance. The foursome had gotten lost on another trail in Ontario, and it was reported that Christina was very shaken up by the experience. She definitely wouldn't have risked the same thing happening again, and her family insist that she wouldn't have ventured away from the trails. Also, the trails were well signposted. If Christina had reached a point which seemed unfamiliar to her, there were plenty of signs to help guide her back in the right direction. 
It is also theorised that Christina may have fallen into the river and subsequently swept away, perhaps after losing her footing on a rock ledge, but there is no evidence to back this up. Search and rescue teams scaled the cliff sides but didn't find anything. Authorities did also explore the possibility that Christina had perhaps run into an animal predator, more specifically a bear, as black bears were very common in the area. However, this theory was quashed. No human bones, blood, drag marks or remnants of clothing were found, so it was unlikely that Christina was attacked by a bear, though it's not completely impossible. Wolves also roamed the area, and again it is possible that Christina may have encountered a lone wolf or even a pack, but once again there's no evidence to prove an attack occurred. Wolf attacks in themselves are extremely uncommon, even more so than bear attacks. Wolves are extremely misunderstood creatures who tend to steer clear of humans. The truth of the matter is, wolves fear humans and will tend to walk away if they encounter one. They will only ever attack if they feel threatened in some way, such as being hunted or a human ventures too near to their pups. And it would seem extremely unlikely that Christina would have gotten into that sort of situation. There is also the rather sinister possibility that Christina may have been abducted or murdered. She was a very trusting young woman, even of those she barely knew. She gave everyone she met the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps someone stopped her along a trail and asked her for help, and without hesitation, she obliged. The yearly drag fest, which occurred in nearby Terrace Bay, had just concluded, and a lot of -of out-of-towners were still in the area, many of which seemed to be trouble, according to the locals. Though abduction and murder, for that matter, seem rather out there, both situations are, unfortunately, entirely possible. According to her family and friends, Christina wasn't acting out of the ordinary at the time she disappeared, although family did think it odd for Christina to go on a run. She didn't enjoy it, and she also had an inflamed callus on her foot, which would have made walking painful at times, let alone running. Christina also didn't appear to have any reason to run away or leave of her own volition. She had future plans to visit the Philippines to carry out missionary work, attend teachers college, and she was excited about an upcoming family trip to Panama. For Christina to disappear off the face of the earth without telling a soul was extremely out of character. Her family and friends insist that she wouldn't have severed ties with those she loved. She just wasn't the kind of person to do that. Christina's friends, Eddie, JB and her cousin Faith are not considered suspects in this case. Authorities believe that the trio weren't involved in her disappearance. No signs indicated that Christina had been a victim of foul play, therefore her case is still being treated as a missing persons case. Some family members are sceptical of this, however, and believe that Christina met with foul play on the day she vanished. Elizabeth, despite holding out hope that her daughter will be found one day, believes that Christina was either murdered in the park or abducted. But ultimately, what fate befell the 20-year-old that summer's day in August of 2007 remains a mystery to this day. When she disappeared, Christina Kaleka was 20 years old, standing at 5 feet 2 inches tall and weighing approximately 126 pounds. She is described as being of Asian origins, more specifically of Filipino descent, with a dark complexion, black wavy hair and brown eyes. When she was last seen on the 6th of August 2007, Christina was wearing a blue hooded sweatshirt, a maroon and purple striped shirt, a pair of black trousers and a pair of white running shoes. 
Following her disappearance, Christina's family set up the Find Christina Kaleka Foundation. Following the official searches, the family themselves, as well as donations made to the foundation by the public, helped finance at least six private searches for Christina. But unfortunately, once again, nothing was found. Due to the extreme expenses of these searches, Elizabeth had to move out of her house and into an apartment. She used every single cent she had to search for her lost daughter. The government of the province of Ontario is currently offering a $50,000 reward for any information leading to the whereabouts of Christina Kaleka. Despite the years that have passed, Christina's family have not given up hope that she will one day be found. Thank you.